All right, I have noon, so we will go ahead and get started with our second session of this final round of our Forage Forum Fridays. So welcome everybody. We thank you for joining us today, um, or if you're watching later on the recording, um, we're excited to share with you today the important considerations when selecting forages. Um, so I have with me today, Dr. Keith Johnson. He's our forage specialist at Purdue University. And I'm Elisha Rogers, the Ag and Natural Resource Educator with Purdue Extension in DeKalb County. Um, so we're excited to kind of share today with you just those things to consider when we're selecting our seeds, our forages, what it is we want to grow. So. Second. There we go. <laughs> you know, one of the things that right. I've noted, Alicia, when I have conversation with, with people and at a starting point, and first of all, I, I want to go back and say uh, to uh, those that are listening to this, uh, Alicia, about a week ago, received a very nice award from the Indiana Forage Council. Uh, very well deserved. Uh, she has been an excellent president for that organization. She has done an excellent job in uh, bringing these forums together that we've had regarding forages. This wouldn't have happened without her leadership. And I also want to thank her for her efforts in uh, developing uh, a very fine newsletter in her tenure of, of doing that. And uh, I hope she considers maybe continuing to do that part of it because she, she did such a fantastic job. But getting back to the, to the topic today, um, you know, I speak to people and they talk about grass and they talk about clover, but they maybe don't know what grass they're talking about or what clover they're talking about. And so we need to get beyond that and uh, learn to be better identifiers of the forage that we do have uh, that's growing in our field. So that's, that's a challenge that I'll throw out to you is to walk those hay fields, walk those uh, pastures and, and verify what you really do have uh, in your pasture. But uh, so that's one of the things we need to do. And the other thing about it is each of these species that we have have strengths and weaknesses. And I think that's probably what Alicia and I really enjoy about forages is we work with a diversity of plants, which is really quite uh, a fun career, actually, to be able to work with uh, many, many different species. Mm -hmm. That's what Dr. Johnson said last week at our Forage Council meeting is that he doesn't just get to work with just soybeans or just corn, just a monoculture. There's there's a polyculture within the forage species that we get to work with and we get to choose from for our selections. So, yeah, it's exciting. There's lots of considerations to think about. Um, what What are you thinking about here in terms of end goal, Alicia? What yep, What are some so things really, you might think about? Yep. So, really, when we ask the question, "What's your end goal?" What do you really want to get out of your forage? What's its purpose? Is it there just to be growing in green or do you want it to improve the soil? Do you want it to feed your animals? Are you making hay with it? What is that end goal for that forage that you're selecting? The other thing is the soil and this is a big thing that we're going to discuss today because thankfully we do have diversity of forages that we do have access to that can grow on different types of soil. And then along the same lines, what do you want from your plant species? Um, again, do you want something that's going to fix nitrogen um, so you don't have to apply nitrogen to the soil? Do you want something that's going to not cause bloat in your animals? Do you want something that's just going to be a grass so you can spray for broad leaves or vice versa, just a broad leaf so you can spray for grasses. What do you want out of your plant species? So again, also considering pasture, hay, a combination of those things as well. Um, or if you're just going to have it as like a an easement area um, along a riverbank, what is that plant's purpose for you? Yeah, going back to that, absolutely, because we can think about there's a lot of people that might think about wildlife attributes 
as a part of that too, that many of these forages uh, can not only be grazed by our livestock, but also then uh, can also then uh, be utilized for wildlife considerations too, depending on how we manage it. But, you know, we're gonna learn today too, that not only does it matter uh, what type of animal you have, whether that's a sheep, a goat, or a, a beef animal, a dairy animal, a dairy cattle, you know, what what class of livestock is being fed and and really looking at the uh, where in the life cycle is the female of that species in terms of her needs. And then also, of course, uh, where a calf might be or a, a lamb or a, a, a kid might be in terms of their stage of production. Mm -hmm. And then probably one of the biggest questions you can ask yourself is, do you have a market for that excess forage? Um, I can remember when I was in my master's thesis defense, that was one question that one of my advisors asked me. And I went completely mind blank on it because I couldn't figure it out. Um, but it's simple. Do you have a market for the excess forage? Can you make hay if you have some have pasture that gets ahead of you? Do you have a place to take that hay? Or do you have a contract that's set up where you can bring extra livestock in to consume that forage? Because potentially, hopefully, if we have good productive years, this could be a good problem you may have. You know, there's lots and lots and lots of choices here. The purpose we've talked about uh, somewhat, we're, we're seeing more and more interest then too of uh, utilizing uh, what some would claim as cover crops. I, I guess I call them niche kind of forage crops uh, that could be utilized for the purpose of soil conservation or feed for livestock or wildlife. Futuristically, I think there's an opportunity if fuel prices get crazily high that entrepreneurs might actually look at uh, some of these fiber containing grasses and take them to a biofuel. Um, then of course, we've talked about the soil type, pH and fertility, we'll talk about that. Yield characteristics, I think ought to be important. And then one thing we need to keep in mind that I think some people fail to remember is what herbicides had you applied and what was your intention of planting a forage and it could be if you haven't gone to the label of that particular product it may say that your plant back restriction ought to be eight months and your intention was to plant the forage three months after the application of the herbicide and unfortunately those young forage seedlings could meet their maker or mm -hmm. die because you didn't follow the plant back restriction in the label. Then we've got kind of that resistance or tolerance to pests. There are a lot of species out there that have new genetically modified varieties that help us fight against things like um, potato leaf hopper. Um, what's the alfalfa one? Alfalfa weevil. Um, we've got the tall fescue, different endophyte novelty um, varieties that are out there. You know, Teaming, the other one that comes along, uh, Alicia, is you think about uh, al uh, Roundup Ready alfalfa. Yeah. And I put yeah. I put all sorts of pests in my categorization of pests. I think about not only yeah. insects, but disease and also yep. think about the weeds. So yep. the Roundup Ready trade in uh, alfalfa might be something one thinks about as they make a choice of an alfalfa variety. Yep. So if you've had issues with something in the past, look to see if there's a resistant or a tolerant variety to help help with that control. Winter hardiness, depending on where you are in Indiana or across the Midwest or across the U.S., you kind of got to pay attention to how winter hardy that forage species is going to be, whether it's going to survive down to wind chills of negative 50, or is it going to be a more of a warmer weather hardy plant? And then the quality traits needed for the animal being fed. Um, so again, like Keith said, are you feeding a um, she or uh, you that's given birth to twins that is milking heavily, or are you feeding a gelding that's just standing out in the pasture, not doing a lot of work? You need to think about those traits. Yeah, this is where the fun comes in with the different types of plants we can work with uh, grass, legumes, forbs. Uh, early in my career, I didn't deal much with even thinking about turnips in a situation. Now that's become quite uh uh, common uh, as a mixture potential for a short term, whether it's a perennial, long living, in other words, annual, one-year deal, or biennial. 
uh, not many biennials that we actually deal with, but they uh, are there. Uh, also, a biennial essentially grows vegetative year one and reproductive year two. When do we need the forage? Is it a warm season grower? Is it a cool season grower? Whether you want a tight sod or whether a bunch grass. So uh, con consideration about a sod grass might be something like smooth brome. Bunch grass would be something like orchard grass. And then the jointing and non-jointing is something that I don't think people know too much about, but brome grass is a jointing grass. It grows back, tries to seed again after its initial hay harvest or utilization as a forage. If you come back too aggressively with a hay harvest or a grazing, you can actually reduce a stand to smooth brome grass uh, pretty drastically because you're too aggressive in its use. So in a rotation sense, how often are you coming back? How often do you want to harvest the crop? That's a consideration as well. And then invasiveness. So there are some species that tend to spread a little bit faster, a little bit more quicker than others. Um, so we need to take those into consideration because they may spread more than what you want them to. Um, some of the species we really don't consider a whole lot anymore just because of that purpose. Um, so just kind of consider how quickly it grows. Yeah, some then, examples of that, Alicia, if we think about it, Johnson grass, a scourge to my name, okay, <laughs> uh, actually came into our country as a forage. Mm -hmm. Kudzu, the yep. legume of the South, can really grow, grow, grow to the point that it uh, can take down uh, <laughs> trees and kill them and, and be problematic in uh, electric lines. Uh, I think about one now that we'll talk about a bit better, reed canary grass uh, is mm -hmm. considered now to be uh, invasive by many people. And uh, uh, so we've got these things we need to be really careful about. Yep. And then really just the ruggedness, toughness, just the ability to come back from bad situations. So across the Midwest, across the U.S. the last few years, we've had a lot of droughty situations. Will those plants come back from it? Or we've had these excessive fast rains where we get five, six, seven, eight inches of rain at a time. Will it be able to stand, withstand some of that standing water? So we need to take all of those into consideration as well. You know, one of the stories I like to tell about the ruggedness, toughness is uh, we were doing some research out at the beef unit and uh, it rained at two in the morning with lightning and the heifers on trial were on a really a small paddock <laughs> and uh, went out the next day and it looked like the ladies had been playing uh, mud volleyball. <laughs> Uh, the soil was turned up. It was one of those things, you turned them on to the next paddock, and thankfully, because we did select ruggedness, toughness, you came back a month later, and believe it or not, uh, the forages were there. Mm -hmm. yep. You know, this, this three-legged stool that some of you uh, of some age probably used to milk uh, cattle that were in a stanchion, um, you know, the perennials are kind of like this. If we manage them well, I think there's three legs. We want good yield, we want good quality, and we want the, the plant to persist. And what happens is if we mismanage is one of those legs gets sawn off and we fall off our little, little chair there, we'll fall off our stool. And so there is a balance of this where we have to manage for persistence to get good quality, to keep a good yield so that we have these year in year out for a long period, as long as we possibly can with these perennials. So it's important to understand the three legs of this stool of a perennial forage plant. Certainly. All right. So one of the things we've talked about was looking at the traits. Where does it, when does it like to grow? Where does it like to go grow? Um, does it come back year after year? So I'm sure all of you know the difference between annual, perennial, biennial, things like that. But these are just kind of where each of those falls in their different categories. So if you're looking for a perennial that will survive northern Indiana winters, you may want to look at something more like the orchard grass, smooth brome grass, timothy, things like that. If you need something as an emergency crop during the summer when it's warmer, you can then look at kind of maybe our warm season annuals category that can maybe fill in a pasture or a hay field, or maybe it was supposed to be a cornfield and you didn't get it planted. So you can go in and try maybe a sorghum sudan cross 
or something along those lines to help you get at least something green and growing to feed your animals that way. So yeah, so here we have, you know, we've got hundreds of thousands of plants in the world. So we essentially brainstormed what we consider probably to be the short list of candidates to consider is what this is. And as Alicia said very well, is you can note that uh, the coolness, the warm season uh, listings there and the annuals, the perennials, and got a couple of Forbes that seem to work pretty well and then several perennial legumes. Mm -hmm. So this is kind of a classic uh, slide that we uh, look at. You'll notice the, uh, the light blue line. Guess what? Alicia, you know what? Grasses what? that are cool season grasses grow when it's cool. Really? <laughs> and you note that. You note that. We get the big boost there, and then we get a little bit of summer dormancy, and then hopefully we get some of those September, October uh, rainfall with the cooling temperature, and so we get a, a second uh, little bit of a hump there uh, on the cool season grasses. Guess what, Alicia? Warm season grasses grow when it's warm. They break dormancy a little earlier or a little later in the in the springtime and a big amount of growth. And so we can see that we could have a complementary system in a grazing situation where we have cool season grasses that are utilized more in the springtime and the fall. And then we could utilize a warm season grass. Could be annual, could be a, a perennial in the summer. And the other thing you'll note is the green line is the forage legumes. And really, I think the base system of a perennial pasture in the Midwest ought to be a perennial grass and a perennial legume. I think that's kind of the base, base system to start with. Mm -hmm. And um, you'll find that with the forage legumes, they actually give a bit more forage type of uh, productivity than in the summer months, uh, particularly if we think about alfalfa, red clover, birds fit trefoil. White clover is a little less drought tolerant or dry weather tolerant, but you can see that we can get a boost then of productivity by a combination of cool season grass and forage legumes in that summer summer time frame. Mm -hmm. And once you get the base system, maybe it's cool season grass, uh, forage legume perennial, uh, and you have a sandy soil, uh, then you may think about uh, a portion of those paddocks could be a warm season grass like a uh, switchgrass, a big blue stem and Indian grass, provided that they meet the needs of the animals that you're grazing. All right, so kind of like we talked about before, um, legumes are have great value when they're added to our grass. Um, legumes are, as a plant, nitrogen fixers. So that means they bring up nitrogen, they fix it, and let it be available to our grass species. Um, so it helps save us on nitrogen costs, nitrogen fertilizer, especially with as high as they are right now. Um, like we saw in our previous uh, previous graph, we see that legumes tend to kind of not go through as much of a slump during the summer. So it helps us keep our yields up during the summer, um, especially for if you're going to be a hay producer. Um, so for us, we've seen going from first cutting to second or third cutting we tend to see a little more of the legume come through in that hay. Um, higher quality forage, again, um, more crude protein, less fiber, higher potassium, magnesium, because you get a little bit more leaf, leaf, leaf space. And that's where a lot of our nutrients are contained is in those leaves. So by adding a legume or a broadleaf plant, you get more leafy material to then have more nitrogen, more nutrients in it. Um, and then obviously we have to consider kind of some of those bloat considerations. So something like alfalfa tends, could potentially cause some bloat in animals, but some of our clovers, birds with trefoil tend to be a little bit less um, bloaty. And then red clover also helps reduce some of the issues caused by our endophyte tall fescue. You know, that was an interesting development that the uh, University of Kentucky, Dr. Aiken's group did down there probably about uh, oh, seven, eight years ago, we talked about uh, this fescue problem of the fungus that causes alkaloids. And we always uh, wanted to add legumes to it because in part we said simply dilution is a solution. Mm -hmm. And that's part of it. But he found that uh, with the uh, endophyte infection, the blood vessels constrict, they, they narrow, and that's a problem. That's one of the issues of... Um, endophyte toxicity. 
if we include red clover, there's a compound in red clover that allows the blood vessels to open, which is kind of a cool, cool thing about red clover that we really didn't know up until just recent times. Interesting. All right. And then how do we decide what we want to plant? Kind of all those things we've been talking about and we'll continue to talk about. Our soil types that we'll review more here in just a minute. Our soil fertility. So how have you managed that soil? Does it need to be managed? Does it need some help? Again, the purpose, what livestock are you feeding? Are you feeding it as a pasture, as a hay, as a silage, as a green crop? What quality? Are you feeding Holstein cows that are producing 100, 150 pounds of milking or a day? Or are you, again, feeding that single gelding that's out in the pasture as just kind of a pet? Um, the nitrogen production, riparian buffer, wildlife, all those need to be taken into consideration as well. So, Then the length of use, you know, the perennial, annual, whether it's filling a niche, niche as a single crop or a double crop opportunity, uh, there's some really fun things we can do, and we'll show you a calendar a little bit uh, later of a consideration about what can be done after winter wheat grain harvest. A lot of options with forages uh, for the rest of the growing season. You know, I really emphasize this uh, web soil survey. Um, for those of you that have not gone to it to find an area of interest, I encourage you to find it. Um, yeah, it takes a little bit of effort, like the first time you do it, you kind of learn how to do it. But uh, I really think this is something, if you don't know your soils in terms of their drainage and their depth of restrictive layer and whether they've got that Fragipan, like we see at a lot of our soils in uh, southern Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, and other regions, uh, in terms of restriction, the texture of the soil, what are the horizonation, slow productivity potential, mm -hmm. and then we can kind of move away from agricultural side, and there's lots of other things related to more than what I'm sharing here even, but uh, how about a home with a basement? Are you thinking about that? Mm -hmm. Or what about, can this particular soil, where's the best place in this acreage to think about a septic system? Mm -hmm. So there's lots of things that can learn. If you haven't done it, uh, browse Web Soil Survey, find your spot. I think you'll find that it's a, a really good program. Yep, it's a lot of fun. One of the one of those rainy days when you're looking for something to do, it's really fun to go on there and really just kind of play and look around and kind of see maybe not what's on your ground, but maybe what's on your neighbor's ground. What do they have to work with as well? So. Well, and the thing is, you might be le one of thinking about leasing a property. Mm -hmm. or purchasing a property. And this kind of gives you a little bit of insight as to what uh, quality of soil it really is. So here's a snapshot. Uh, we've got three soil types here that uh, come up with the use of computerization and uh, tells us the acreage. Uh, the AOI is the area of interest. So we can take a look at here. And, you know, I use this as a starting point uh, to sample uh, our soils by soil type if they've been managed similarly. Uh, so I think that has uh, some real use, but uh, you click then on what is in blue there to a link and it'll give you the, all those descriptions. So it's, it's, it's pretty good. It's a, it's a nice program. All right. So along those same lines, we need to consider how well that soil is drained. So that's why the web soil survey is great because it tells you what your soils are and really a lot of these classifications. So is it well-drained? Is it somewhat poorly drained? Is it poorly drained? That all makes a difference on how much water is retained in that soil and therefore helps us be able to choose what plants can survive a little bit more of a wet root situation than maybe some others. Um, so this is just a chart that shows a little bit on our perennials, kind of where they prefer to grow in terms of drainage. You know, you know, I put some... the yellow there, uh, Alicia, for a reason so that I would not, frankly, forget. <laughs> um, Alcite clover, I want to just mention, and I'll, we'll show a really horrific picture uh, here in a bit. Uh, Alcite clover can cause photosensitization uh, mm -hmm. on white-skinned uh, animals, particularly related to equine. But on all color horses, they can cause liver degeneration. So I want to I want to mention that. Uh, reed canary grass uh, has been legislated in Indiana such that we cannot purchase uh, reed canary grass seed any longer. Uh, 
uh, because of the fact that it has been noted to be invasive. It can it can go and grow, uh, get into water streams and uh, do that, uh, which I find unfortunate that it's that way because it certainly is one that really can grow in those poorly drained areas. And uh, for those of you that have it, continue to use it, but you're not going to be able to seed uh, new acreage in the state of Indiana. Sweet clover, I mentioned there as well, just from the standpoint of uh, it's got the bleeding disease that can cause hemorrhaging uh, to occur if it molds uh, in some form of conserved feed, such as silage or hay. So just a bit of awareness there. I still think the best place probably for sweet clover is probably in a soil improvement, getting growing some nitrogen. You're gonna find it being used, I think, in bee production sort of things and that interest. Uh, but there are also states in the country, I will tell you, that have declared sweet clover invasive uh, because it does have the ability to take over, particularly you'll find in the rain states, you find that sweet clover can take over uh, what was uh, you know, highly productive rangeland. All right. And then when we consider our annuals, so they only grow for a single season, again, looking at somewhat poorly drained up to well drained to all drainage classifications. So. And I want to just mention here again, an annual uh, ryegrass is I was at a seminar one time talking about ryegrass with a plant breeder from Texas A&M. And, you know, he was an authority and, you know, his really his words were, you know, annual ryegrass, the annual is a bit of a misnomer, misnomer because there's a lot of outcrossing that it can occur in that particular genus. And so he really was kind of emphasizing the fact that the annuals ryegrass really can be a weak perennial. So I think be a little bit cautious in taking the word annual in annual ryegrass literal. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay, and when we look at the soil fertility, when people tell me they bought a property, they want to do stuff on it, first thing I'm going to ask them is, have they had a soil test done? A simple $20, $25 soil test can tell you a lot about how you need to manage that soil, about how you need to fertilize it, and then being able to choose what species grow well with what you have there currently. Yeah, you know, I was in southern Indiana young in my career, and uh, some farmer was next to me. If you want to hit the next button there, uh, what he said is, uh, you know, we call this poverty weed. Uh, and it was broom sedge that he was looking at. And it's an interesting plant. It's one we would call a bioindicator. Uh, and uh, essentially, it's a low pH, low phosphorus condition. And uh, we don't necessarily have to take it out with a herbicide. What we do is apply some lime and phosphorus fertilizer. If that's what the soil test is slow but sure, you'll find the productive forages will come back. The other thing I've noted, Alicia, and I don't know up in your area, do you see this scattered about any at all? <laughs> yeah. So we actually had it on our, our property when we first moved in. Um, so it's just a little bit of a fertilizer, a little bit of a, a, a management adjustment. It disappeared and it's where we have our bucks house now so yeah you know yeah. i used to think this was a southern indiana concern and over you know my career i've seen it kind of creep creep upward mm -hmm. it seems more into the northern part of the state it's a good time of year to see this uh, in pastures and hay fields because it takes on that bronzy's cash so uh, don't have a wreck when you start gawking looking at the fields <laughs> but uh, you can take a look and see this uh, this time of yep. year Yep. And so if you're interested in learning more about some of those bioindicator plants and fertility specifically, we're going to talk more about this on our March 10th Forage Forum Friday. So just a little sneak peek for you. <laughs> All right. And then looking at this graph here, this just kind of shows us a kind of soil acidity, um, liming of soils, kind of where different forages prefer to have their basic pH at. And so this is from the forage field guide. So if you have not purchased the forage field guide, you need to wait a little bit because it is under review for the new edition. Um, but it is an incredibly handy tool to have. Um, it's got everything in it you can think of. And this is one of those charts. <laughs> um, and so it looks at pH levels and kind of what those different plants prefer. So you can see maybe if you have a pasture that like is basically at like a 6-2, you have a little bit less selection. Well, my 
mouse here, a little bit less selection of what you can work with. So you have basically these here on the left versus if you have a pH of 7.0, you have a much broader range of species that you, that you can work with in your pasture or hay selection. So. Yeah, just real quickly, why that's important is uh, nitrogen fixation, the rhizobia bacteria need to have a pH that's appropriate uh, for them. And so if we get too acid, they don't function. Also, you probably have seen the classic uh, nutrient availability. Most nutrients throughout, if you were in that uh, sweet spot, as we say, 6.5 to 7.0, uh, the width of, of availability tends to be greater there for most of our uh, nutrients that are needed for plant growth. All right, so this is just, again, another chart, just basically looking at where, kind of following what that last chart was, but looking at low, low, medium, 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 high, and high soil fertility. So are, do they require a lot more fertility and or do they require a lot more maintenance as well with it um, when you're maintaining them? You know, Alicia, there was a study at our Throckmorton Purdue mm -hmm. Ag Center where alfalfa was the crop of uh, fertility experiment and big differences with P and K uh, response. And mm -hmm. it was a soil that needed both fertilizers. After that experiment was done, they superimposed switchgrass on there and mm -hmm. it its response was minimal. And it's really nice looking at this because you see the high fertility need of alfalfa, which was really shown in that experiment. Then we switched it over to switchgrass, which is in the low medium column. So there really is a big difference. The other thing I noted on the Lesbodiza species I wanted to say is that um, striate, uh, Korean Lesbodiza, those are annual Lesbodiza. If you expect them to reseed, you're going to find that you're probably in Indiana going to be kind of three counties in from the Ohio River Valley, uh, tend not to be as effective uh, in terms of providing much forage if you're up there in the Michiana area. Yep, correct. All right, and then we've got, well, there's a lot to consider with forages. <laughs> so other things that you need to consider, um, things like the winter hardiness, the yield, the pest resistance, their quality, their flowering date. There's a lot to consider when you're looking at forages. You know, I think about orchard grass. I've evaluated some in trials. There can be a two-week difference in maturity in terms of flowering date. That's huge when you think about coupling it with a legume like alfalfa. I've heard people say, I hate this orchard grass, it's stemmy. Well, you know why they hated the orchard grass? Because it was stemmy. They got an early to mature variety that mm -hmm. didn't match up well with the alfalfa or it could be red clover. So we, in that case, we're matching with a legume. We want a late to mature orchard grass. Same can be said about perennial ryegrasses as well. Mm -hmm. The other thing about VNS, uh, I'm not going to purchase VNS. Uh, variety not stated. VNS, variety not stated. Now, what that tells me is I don't know anything about winter hardiness, yield, pest resistance, quality, or flowering date. Uh, the seed maybe tends to be a little bit cheaper, but you don't know genetically what you're getting. You're taking risk. And that'll be on a seed tag. And like we talked about, um, with the weather changes, with the weather conditions we've had the last decade or so, drought is definitely something that we need to consider. So what are those species that can withstand not having as much moisture over a long period of time versus those that need more consistent moisture? So you have something like Kentucky bluegrass, the perennial ryegrass, a couple of our clovers that need consistent moisture. Versus a lot of our, um, not summer annuals, but yeah, warm season annuals, they tend to be a little more drought hardy, I guess you could say. Our Sudan, sorghum Sudans, um, Pearl even our, our alfalfa can withstand having a dry period or a longer length of dryness to their growing season. You know, a, a trivia you could talk about at the supper table tonight uh, and, and show that you're genius is ask if ever you're having supper if do you know where the center of origin of alfalfa was and you can authoritatively say well it's in the modern day country of iran so you think yeah. about what soil conditions are there in iran you can think about well yeah alfalfa is pretty pretty drought tolerant isn't it 
Yep. Yeah. So Certainly. kind of interesting how these plants evolve, but that's uh, the center of origin of that particular uh, species. Mm -hmm. All right, and then again, like we said, winter hardiness is something else to consider. So it's not just winter hardiness, but it's basically it's rating and its scale as well. So yes, we have the poor, fair, good, very good, but then there's also number ratings you can look at. Um, so especially in something like alfalfa, when you're choosing that, you really need to look at the winter hardiness of the variety that you're looking at. Yeah, there are varieties that grow best in Southern California that will work there. And if we were to bring them here, they'd uh, they'd meet their maker uh, through the course of the winter, whereas uh, they would not be productive enough for our varieties to go down. So alfalfa is kind of an interesting in terms of its breadth of winter hardiness. Mm -hmm. All right, and then again, the pest resistance ratings. Um, so really, how high do you want that resistance to be? Um, so you've got everywhere from that plant being susceptible, so very low resistance, up to what we consider more than a 51% rating is considered high resistance. So it's not, it's a little bit lower set scale than maybe some other scales we'd look at, but this is kind of what the industry standards are in terms of pest resistance when we're looking at like the Roundup Ready Alfalfa, spraying it and how well it grows after being sprayed versus how well the weeds grow that are sprayed. Your potato leaf hopper, which I think am I getting ahead of myself? Nope, not quite yet. <laughs> we'll talk about that in a little bit. So we just need to look at kind of what are those ratings and what is it we're trying, what pest are we trying to help get better control of? You know, the reason I bring that up is, uh, you know, greater than 51% doesn't sound that great, but when you work with a, a self-pollinated crop like wheat seed or soybean, they're genetically more similar among their plant to plant. Uh, similar with hybrid corn, you got a mother and you got a father and you got a you know a, a, a single cross there. Uh, with forages, you've got lots of parents that shed pollen, so you you don't get this. It's a hundred percent. Okay, so that's the reason why high resistance would be at a lower classification as compared to self-pollinated crops like wheat or uh, cross-pollinated uh, uh, single crop corn. Boy, the other thing we can look at here is uh, just what diseases do you have in your neighborhood, and if you've had experience with something. Uh, first of all, cultural practices, uh, we don't necessarily need to rely on genetics, but I sure would there too, but crop rotation can be extremely helpful. Uh, making the hay in a timely fashion, so if it does happen to have some leaf spot on it, uh, don't let that uh, go, you know, another 10 days to particularly uh, try to spread on to the next crop, get it harvested. Uh, and then sclerotinia is kind of an interesting one that... Uh, just by seeding date alone can help us reduce that uh, particular disease. Uh, it's kind of a melting out disease that can happen uh, in, in large spots. And so seeding in the spring rather than late summer that can help that. Then again, let's rely on our genetics. How resistant is it to uh, our, our insects, to our nematodes, to our diseases? All right, so here's our potato leaf hopper resistance. So. We've got our little nymph, so our little green guy, and then we have our adult here. So the potato leaf hopper resistant alfalfa, basically what they've gone and done is kind of bred it or basically raised the genetics to basically make that plant more hairy um, because those hairs really deter both the nymphs and the adults. So you can see those glandular hairs here sticking out that's a plant that's been bred to be more potato leafhopper resistant. So it's not something that is a chemical that's in the plant. It's just the physical characteristics of that plant that help deter the feeding of the nymph and the adult on that alfalfa. These, th this is an interesting insect. You know, it's kind of like the, uh, what do we call people that migrate to Florida and Arizona? They're the winter birds. What do we call them? Winter birds, yeah. <laughs> yeah, the winter birds. This is kind of a winter bird. Uh, it likes living on the uh, coast of Alabama and Georgia and Florida. That's where it's in in the winter. And then when we get these these currents of air from the Gulf in the spring, how would you like to be an adult, uh, a leaf hopper 
on an air current, I don't like a roller coaster, so I don't want to be a leaf hopper. But then you get deposited in an alfalfa field and you create a family and then you get uh, the sap sucking insect that stunts our plants. So this is a wonderful, wonderful technology for people in our region because people, when they see the damage, it's too late to be really controlling them by spray. The damage has been done. And so the other thing is, you know, we have good intention to do crop scouting with a net. Uh, some people do it, and we really don't want to be just willy-nilly spraying insecticides because guess what? There's beneficial insects that eat these things. Yep. When I was in graduate school at Michigan State, one of our studies was potato leaf hopper, and that well, there was one particular year one day everything looked okay the next day you could see a drastic difference between the two two types of varieties those that were resistant and those that weren't so it does make a difference yeah i think the next graphic really shows the population difference between uh, some uh, experiment that we did at indiana on a regional basis but just look at that uh, when they were cut on july the third and then a month later you can see that the the resistant varieties uh even I could ride that roller coaster, I think. But the one, the other one, the green one, no way, Jose. I mean, I'm not going to be on that one. So you can see that the population, which is the number of nymphs uh, that we got with sweeping the alfalfa was very, very high. We now have varieties that are, you know, around 70 plus percent resistance. So uh, some choices are out there for your use. All right. So we've got a couple of polls to kind of keep you guys interested. So you guys get to help us kind of choose. So if alfalfa suffers because of inadequate drainage, what would be a better option? So we've got our first poll up here. So your options are red clover, white clover, or both. So go ahead and answer. Oh, how about I launch it first? There we go. Now you can answer it. <laughs> So again, this would kind of go with the handout that I emailed out earlier, but looking at those drainage qualities. Oh, we're going to learn something today, Alicia. I know. <laughs> yes. All right. So majority said both, but we kind of had then a split between the red and the white clover. So. So our red clover might be a little bit better option because again, we've got our alfalfa in the well-drained category. You've got your white clover way over here and poorly drained, but if you don't have overly damp soils, you could go with red clover. So both could definitely be an option, but if you have just kind of somewhat poorly drained, you may wanna go with red clover to start with, so. Yeah, and I think uh, that question probably was probably more yeah. towards possibly use as a hay crop, okay? So, yeah, yep. I can see if you think in pasture and hay, you might swing to a little bit of white clover in there. Yep. So, yep. So I just <laughs> gave away the answer for the next question. <laughs> we'll see if they listened. I know. <laughs> or if I listened. <laughs> yep. All right. Share results. Oh, I see what you did. Yeah. Yep. Got to go through there. Okay, there we go. All right, so question two. <laughs> so don't pretend the answer the, Don't look here. at the slide behind. <laughs> yep, so if perennial ryegrass suffers because of drought tolerance, <laughs> what might be a better option? <laughs> so this one's kind of a give me. <laughs> but. So we had talked about that. Um, and so the Kentucky bluegrass we saw was really poor in terms of its drought tolerance. It needs that moisture. Um, Timothy could also be an option if we wanted to. All right. But you guys read the slide, so great job. <laughs> yeah, tall fescue is definitely a more drought tolerant, cool season grass. Yep. All right. So question three. Hey, this is kind of fun. I know. <laughs> if I can figure it out, give me just a second. Oh, you're doing great. There we go. Better you than me. <laughs> okay. 
All right, so question three. If our soil has a pH of 6.2, so again, remember lower towards that left end of that spectrum, what might be a better legume option than alfalfa? Because remember, alfalfa liked more closer to that 6.75 to 7 range. You've got bird's foot trefoil and alcite clover as your options. All right, so we've got 63% said all like clover, 38% said bird's foot trefoil. We have all like clover might be a little bit better. Um, yeah, I think bird's foot probably would like to be in the 6.5 range. Yeah. And remember, yep. that doesn't so, sound like a big difference, but they, remember, it's a log scale thing, and the difference mm -hmm. between 6.2 and 6.5 is bigger than one realizes. Yep, yep, certainly. But again, we have to be cautious. If we are planting this pasture or this hay field for horses, you may not want to consider alcite clover as an option. So, all right, and then question four because I think I gave away the answer on the next slide, so we'll wait a minute. <laughs> so with colder Indiana nor or northern Indiana winter temperatures, what would be a better grass than potentially orchard grass to plant? So we have Timothy or tall fescue. All right. So a majority of you said tall fescue. So it could go either direction. Um, but when we look at our winter hardiness map here, so looking at our winter hardiness, um, again, we have our orchard grass in the fair category. We've got the tall fescue in the good, and we've got the timothy in the very good. So we could go with very, either direction. Um, but Timothy has a little bit better rating than what the tall fescue does. So, you know, the other thing we get selections within a species. Again, we kind of talked about disease ratings and so forth, but we also have this mutation of the brown midrib. Uh, great finding uh, here at Purdue University is now in the mainstream that you can purchase brown midrib sorghum and pearl millet. Uh, there's improved digestibility because it has. Um, lesser amount of lignin or an older type of lignin that uh, makes the crop more digestible. And you can see that there is a, a brown midrib there on that sorghum that I've shown you. The other one that's come out more recently is low lignin alfalfa uh, that uh, you can extend the harvest interval and still maintain uh, pretty good quality forage. So uh, that's kind of a new development within the alfalfa world. Then, of course, the endophyte infected tall fescue that produces those alkaloids uh, that cause problems. Uh, you can purchase low endophyte, which is less than a 5% infection in the seed. Uh, and then a newer one that's uh, kind of a great use of biotechnology uh, that developed a novel or friendly endophyte. And uh, that is uh, a fescue that has uh, an, uh, an endophyte, but it doesn't produce the alkaloids, but it gives strength to the plant. Kind of an interesting. Uh, interesting thing there. And then coming soon, I'm happy to say, uh, good Purdue University work is uh, durin-free sorghum. Uh, durin is a precursor to that uh, poison that can come out at uh, a stress time, particularly we think about in this region of freezing temperatures. It could be with drought, but uh, durin-free, if it's free of durin, it doesn't produce the prussic acid. Uh, this is in development with a company out of Colorado, and I understand there may be limited supplies in 2023 with expansive amounts probably available in the future future coming years very soon. All right, so like we've talked about, one of the things we need to consider is those nutrient needs of our animal. So we look at switchgrass. Switchgrass has a lot of purposes, a lot of uses to it, but you have to consider. Are you feeding an animal or are you raising it for biofuels? 
there's a lot of different lignin content and basically the protein levels as well, there's a difference in those varieties of that switchgrass that you're growing. So it's important to know what your what your end goal is for that product and choosing those varieties based upon that. You know, we've gotten quite wrong very, very well in a pasture situation with switchgrass, but we don't have lactating dairy cows or lactating <laughs> dairy goats. We're, we're feeding uh, animals that can get quite along quite nicely in vegetative switchgrass. But if I was in the dairy industry and had my milk cows or milk goats on it, uh, you probably wouldn't be in the industry very long. Yep. Then we're showing the full range there. I tried to show there kind of the range of nutritional needs. We've got the super high quality alfalfa and then uh, kind of a neat thing that we can do for certain uh, stages of life of the animal is we can use crop residues like uh, corn residues after grain harvest. Yep, certainly. All right. And then again, like we've talked about, again, the needs vary when you're even looking at horses. Um, so you've got the high quality legume grass for maybe mare lactation or maybe a high production racehorse or draft horse that's doing a lot of work or just a basic good quality grass does perfectly fine for most of our retired geldings that are just staying out there in the past year that might be used once, maybe twice a month. So you've got to look at how heavy those animals are used, how much production they have going. So are they milking heavily or not at all? A lot of things to consider when you're looking at the livestock themselves. Yeah, which is really showing here, you can have the same ewe. One year she may have triplets. Another year she may have a single. And then when she doesn't have the young at her side, uh, she can get along quite well on a lower quality grass or even crop residues for a while if she's in decent body condition. Yep. That's what we've got a flock of hair sheep. And right now they're getting a third of a bale of, so there's eight ewes and one ram. They're getting a third of a bale of hay twice a day and they are staying flat and fluffy. <laughs> so versus when those ewes go to lamb, then we'll go ahead and give them a higher quality hay to help offset that needed nutrition. So we can take again a look at the stockpiling aspect. Uh, you know, tall fescue is fantastic for stockpiling. Uh, it grows well in cooler temperatures, uh, continues to grow. Uh, gosh, in your area of the state, Alicia, probably even in late October, you get down to the Ohio River Valley, it'll start be, still continue to be putting on some vegetation uh, in, in early November. And then again, we talked about the potato leaf hopper resistant alfalfa. So again, uh, we've got differences uh, that we can select crops or even varieties within the species. The calendar is kind of a thing calendars. too. Yeah, yep. we got the calendar. So always take your eye to the star. That's where we start the calendar. So we seeded winter wheat in October. It's sitting in dormancy now. We're going to harvest the grain in late June or July, depending on where you're located. And then we can follow that with these different types of uh, summer annual grasses, annual rye grass, oats, turnips, uh, royal seed radish. And so there's certainly many, many different things we can seed after the wheat is harvested as a grain and utilize it uh, depending uh, on what the crop is, as pasture or, or hay or silage. And uh, so great options in terms of double crop opportunities. Then we've got corn silage. We've grown the corn for silage production. We harvest that probably uh, by early September. We can seed annual ryegrass or the winter small grains. Opportunity if mother nature is kind uh, to grow some grazing uh, there in the month of December. And if the soils aren't super wet, we can do that. And if they're not available to be enough to graze, let it over winter. Graze in April if the soils permit. And if not, then we can take that off as a hay or silage crop. So. Uh, many dairy farmers in the past kind of had this type of cycle and still continues today, uh, where essentially we can bear a soil pretty pretty well, as you know, with silage production of corn and cover that with a cover crop but still have a second uh, uh, crop, a double crop of a good, decent quality type of forage. Mm -hmm. So we've talked about uh, this need again, just as a reminder, base, base system. Are we going to talk about a pure stand or a mixture? 
I think that's a decision you're going to have to make for the purpose intended. Mm -hmm. Yep. So how how much do you want to manage it and things like that? So do you want to be able to easily manage weeds that may pop up, in which case you would want a pure stand of something? Or do you want to have maybe a little bit different management style if you have that blended mixture? And then the complementarity of a warm season grass might come into play. I think we need to be cautious when we buy the pre-blends. Uh, they may not be the species you want. Uh, they may not be the best varieties. There may be some variety not stated in there. You have little control of what you put into it as the variety. And I wanna share a little bit of a math example here that the proper ratio, that's very, very doubtful. <laughs> yep, so, all right. So this is kind of mathematical, um, kind of looking at potentially a bag of seed. So we need, this will be some of those numbers that you will find on that seed tag when you're looking at it. So I'll let Keith kind of explain and walk through these calculations. Yeah, so if we go over to the percent of mix and weight, we've got the red weight there. That's what you're gonna see on the seed tag. And you know, I actually maybe even thought until I had an example of somebody calling me about this, that is not the expectation that you're gonna see in the field because there are different sizes of seed, as can be noted there in the seeds per pound of forage. Timothy is dinky, okay, it's small. And then you've got others like uh, alfalfa and red clover that have fewer seed per pound. So if you work through the mathematics and we go to the far right, and I wanna highlight the Timothy uh, row, potential of per percent of stand with what is seeded is 41% Timothy but if you go back to the weight column by weight, it was only 14% of the weight of that bag of seed because the seed is small of Timothy. So then when you seed it, you have the potential for greater stand. So keep that in mind. And uh, you know, companies that are really forage based and understanding do a pretty good job of creating these blends. But I think this is a point of awareness that we need to make is don't think that the percent of weight on a bag is what you're going to see in the field because seed size varies. Certainly. And then another thing of caution when you're looking at a seed tag is look at this weed seed. Is there, what percentage of weed seed is there possibly in that bag? Do you really want who knows what weeds in your pasture? So you want to make sure you have a low percentage there. Inert matter, that can be things like a, a coating on the seed. Um, so it could be where they have the inoculum for the legume. So the clover and alfalfa incorporated into that coating. Could be maybe a little bit of dirt or a little bit of extra material from the cleaning process. So you want to make sure these numbers are all much lower than what your desirable species are. Mm -hmm. get my pointer right so yeah this was an interesting trial we had a variety that was called duo in yellow there phenomenal first year this was a fesculoleum as compared to the tall fescues and you can see that uh, the second year total however the duo fell down as compared to any other choices so if i was in this game for a long period of time I'd be more interested in uh, Tuscany and the Kentucky 31 non-infected, NI non-infected, because the asterisks indicate that they were uh, higher uh, yielding statistically, or the 9301 Kentucky FA that was uh, experimental at that time. If I wanted something fast and furious, I'd want the racehorse, maybe a first year total duel would be great, but you're going to find that over time it, uh, it fell off real quickly. The third year, there's hardly anything out there with that dual variety. So that's why, if you get ahead of myself, that's why it's important and easy to look at, especially university studies. They compare a lot of different varieties from a lot of different companies to really see what, how well they perform under different situations. So the other thing is there can be some poisonous properties in forages. And, uh, you know, I'll bet you something we ate, all of us eat today. If you ate enough of it often enough, it probably could cause a problem metabolically. Um, so, you know, I think the one that's most common probably we think about bloat. 
Uh, the slobbers is called the black patch infected red clover. Uh, the bleeding disease of moldy sweet clover. Uh, alkaloids and reed canary grass. The stress sorghum I talked about in terms of prussic acid. The endophyte infected tall fescue, the alkaloids, and the alcite clover. Uh, if you look in the lower right, you can see that poor animal there uh, had the alcite clover and essentially was having second and third degree burn-like symptoms on the on the white portion of its skin and its muzzle sunburn badly. Uh, again, though, it isn't just a white-skinned uh, animal concern. This uh, poor animal and any other colored animal would have had liver problems going on. So just kind of be aware of, of this and uh, uh, be aware that uh, some of these things can happen. But again, just to say, I think anything that you and I ate today, if we had enough of it, uh, we probably uh, wouldn't feel too well either. So, but they can happen. They can happen. All right, so really, there's a lot of thought that goes into choosing your forward species, but there's a lot of great resources out there to help you as well. So like we talked about, the forage field guide, looking at your local university studies, just taking into consideration, knowing what your soils are, your soil fertility, all of those are really good starting points to help you choose the forage that will thrive best in your situation. You know, the, and to close, I would say too, as you go about and working with people, find individuals that have a passion for forages, um, mm -hmm. that really understand them, that are in the business to understand them, have really been trained. They're going to be most useful to you. Uh, I would encourage you to also talk to other producers that have been in the in the business for a while and get their insight. But it does take some thought to really figure out what works best for you. But believe me, it's it's worth the time certainly is so all right so with that we'd be happy to take any questions you may have and we have one final just overall poll for you to answer if you wouldn't mind so let that there we go so at this point in time we'll take any questions you may have you can go ahead and unmute or type it in the chat box All right. Well, thank you so much, Keith, for your time today. Um, it's great working with you on this topic. And we look forward to our next session next Friday, February 24th, again here at noon Eastern Standard Time. And next week, I believe we have um, one of the professors from over in Illinois is going to be speaking with us on kind of how our plant health overall affects our animal health as well. So just that overall management of our species and how our animals react to it as well. So we look forward to having you again next week. So. I have, have, have a question. I have a question. Oh, yep, we do. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> when is the best date to start frost seeding? <laughs> So I'm going to ask a, a question of Andy. Andy, where are you located? To be real specific to you. If you don't mind sharing, maybe I should ask that. <laughs> okay. So in general, I would say probably a good time if we're going to look at the... Yeah, Andy, where are you located? Yes. Yeah, I'm in Jennings yep. County. Jennings, Jennings County. Okay, very good. You know, I would say that uh, we're getting into an ideal time. Uh, I prefer not doing it in January um, from the standpoint, I think, reducing the iterations of cold and, and uh, warm that we seem to experience, the fewer of those you go through, the better. But, you know, I noted a few days ago, I was getting that honeycomb uh, frosting effect on our soil. Uh, we talk about frost seeding, and then uh, many times if you think about it, you may have seen soil that kind of takes on a honeycomb look. What happens is you get the shrinking and swelling of, of the soil particles, and if you've got the broadcasting of the seed on top, that shrinking and swelling can actually do a little bit, if you will, natural getting the seed in better contact uh, with the mm -hmm. soil. 
you don't want to be broadcasting this into uh, any residual grass from the previous year or forage of the previous year that's probably any greater than four inches in height. Otherwise, the seed gets hung up on the vegetation and never makes its way to the ground. But I think now we're getting into that uh, that time frame when soil conditions uh, allow one to get on the soil surface uh, to do that. Uh, uh, and I would try to have it done before the crop breaks winter dormancy. That would the other, be the other thing I'd say. I'd, I'd try to have it done there at your locale, probably by uh, the, uh, oh, the third week of March. I'd want to be done. Yeah, we was debating about starting this week, trying to get ahead of this little freeze here. Very good. So, all right. Well, I appreciate it. Not a problem. Any other questions while we're on? And just keep in mind that uh, just because Alicia and here I are here today doesn't mean we can't uh, talk to you tomorrow or the next week. So or after that. Great. Next week, we'll both be a little busy at the start of the week with the Heart of America Grazing Conference taking place down in Ferdinand. So we're excited for that experience to be here in Indiana this year. So Very good. All right. Seeing no other questions, we thank you all for being on today and have a wonderful weekend.